So thank you very much for tuning in to this webinar on what do neurology journal editors look for when evaluating manuscripts. And I will be telling you about Therapeutic Advances in Neurological Disorders, which is SAGE's flagship neurology journal. I will also then tell you about research trends in neurology, and I will exemplify this by highlighting some articles that have been sent to the journal by your Chinese colleagues. I will also show you some tips on how to get published, namely, what's the overview of publication process, how to choose the right journal, what kind of order services does SAGE provide to you, as well as tips for writing your paper, including research and publishing ethics and how to best report your research. There will be some tips on how to communicate with the editors and how to address the comments by the peer reviewers. There will be some examples of successful articles as well as some common mistakes to avoid. And I will go through Sage's portfolio of neurology journals and summarize everything that we have learned. And finally, I will introduce you to Sage's China Auto Gateway. So I'm Managing Editor at Therapeutic Advances in Neurological Disorders, which is Sage's flagship neurology journal. It's the leading cold open access in neurology. Our editor-in-chief is Professor Ralph Gold from Germany, who is very well known in the field of multiple sclerosis research. We also have associate editors in epilepsy, stroke, neuromuscular disease, and so forth. It's a fairly popular journal, so every year our articles get read and downloaded by over one million times. The journal has a very rigorous peer review and editorial standards and we aim to publish all accepted articles rapidly online. The journal is listed on PubMed and is also indexed in Scopus, Web of Science, and Scientific Citation Index Expanded. It has an official impact factor of 3.58. You can find a lot more information on our website, tan.sagebook.com. We also have lots of more information there on how to submit your manuscript and how to prepare it. Now to go on to the research trends in neurology, I will show you some highlighted articles from China that have been recently published in the journal. One of the trending fields is neuroimmunology. We are seeing a lot of research in this area. In fact, so much that we have recently uh, started a special collection on autoimmune neurology. This special collection is guest editors by Professor Marino Stelakas from Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, USA. And some of the articles from China that have been published in this special collection on neuroimmunology include uh, an article by Yang Chen et al. on application of the latest 2017 McDonald criteria in a Chinese population. These patients present with clinically isolated syndrome, but we know that some of these patients will progress to multiple sclerosis. The question is, how can we predict who will progress? And Chen and colleagues applied this latest uh, criteria in Chinese population to test whether they improved their prediction power, and indeed they find that applying these criteria will help predict who will progress to multiple sclerosis and who will never have any further symptoms. Another interesting article in neuroimmunology is by Mingjia League and colleagues. So they checked whether early prednisolone or other immunosuppressant therapies could prevent generalization in ocular myasthenia gravis. So a bit like in multiple sclerosis, some patients present with ocular myasthenia gravis and never show further symptoms, but other will progress to generalized myasthenia gravis, which is a much more severe disease. And Lee and colleagues found that indeed early immunosuppressant therapy can reduce the risk of progression in these patients. Another special collection that we are running and one that is still open for new submissions is a special collection in advances in neuroimaging. We saw a lot of really interesting research in neuroimaging at the moment. Uh, there are technical advances, new radial ligands, all kinds of progress that we want to capture in special collection. 
and this is indeed our most special collect most popular special collection to date. And this, like all of our other special collections, feature invited reviews that are written by key opinion leaders in this field, and they are complemented by call for papers that is open for all. So if you're doing research in this field, this is a great way to get your article highlighted. And as mentioned, this collection is still open for a submission. So if you're doing clinical neuroimaging research, you might want to consider it. Among the articles that we have recently published, um, Yu Peng Li and colleagues have this extremely interesting radiomics article where they use high order radiomics features extracted from fluorescent brain images. And they found that these can be used for computer aided diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. Another paper published as part of this collection was by Yu Chi Yang and colleagues who found that coded nucleus and cognitive function are more preserved in patients with young onset Parkinson's disease than in those who get disease when they are older. So it's quite interesting to know that the disease is somewhat different depending when you get it. So not all patient populations are the same. We also have a number of emerging topics that are very new and where very interesting research is emerging. So one of the latest topics to emerge is that of machine learning. And as an example, we have this article by Feng Wan and colleagues on personalized risk prediction of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage after stroke thrombolysis. And they were able to use machine learning model to make this kind of personalized risk prediction. And this is quite interesting because it can take some of the work away from the basic clinicians. And of course, uh, COVID-19 is one of the very recently emerged topics that we see in the journal. The latest article to be published on this topic was a letter by Hai Yang Wang and colleagues on the potential neurological symptoms of COVID-19 and the importance of recognizing these symptoms in these patients. Uh, SAGE has a company-wide policy on COVID-19 articles. So all articles relating to this disease are fast track to peer review and production. They are all free to publish, and they are all made open access immediately upon publication with no embargo. So if you're submitting your research on COVID-19, the subscription journal we will automatically open it for everybody. So it will have open access license. It will be accessible to everybody. And if you're submitting your article on COVID-19 to an open access journal, we will be made, make it, making it free to publish. There will be no APCs. So if you're conducting research in this area, please do consider all journals. This applies for all SAGE's portfolio, all journals. And finally, we have collected articles on COVID-19 into a special coronavirus hub. So this is all articles are free to read. So if you're interested in this topic, please do give it a visit. I will be now sharing some tips on how to get published. So first of all, to give you a brief overview of the publication process. Once you have finished preparing your article and you're submitting it, what happens is that, first of all, the editorial staff of the journal will conduct some initial checks. This would include checking that the articles in the journal scope. They will be checking that it applies with the journal's formatting. They will check for the presence of references, uh, correct citation style, and they will be checking also whether it conforms to the best reporting standards and whether all the ethics statements that are needed are there, conflict of interest, interest and funding statements, and so forth. They will also do an initial check on whether the article has the required novelty and impact to be included in this journal. And if these checks are all clear, the article will then progress to peer review. So the journal's editor will find typically two independent peer reviewers. And this process may take up to a couple of months, depending on the journal. And once the peer review reports are in, the associate and editor and editor-in-chief will jointly make a decision. And for the first version of the article, the decision will almost always be a revision or reject. It's very rare that an article would get accepted without any revisions. Quite a few articles get rejected at this stage. However, 
the most common decision is revision. And that's good news because then that means you will get a chance to revise your article and address the peer reviewer comments. And if you do this satisfactorily, hopefully then your article will get accepted for publication. If it's being rejected at this stage, please don't be put down by it then just submit to another journal. And if you have received reviewer comments, you can often use them to improve your paper. And it is going to be more likely to get accepted the next time you submit it. Important thing to consider before you submit is to select the right journal. So do consider whether the journal meets your needs. So pay attention to the journal scope, whether it corresponds to your article topic, and have a look if the journal has impact factor and if and where it's indexed, including PubMed, Scopus Web of Science. Do pay some attention to the quality threshold of your intended journal as well as whether it's an open access journal or provides an open access option. Finally, you may want to spend some time considering the length limits and other restrictions of the journal, as well as its turnaround times, depending on in how much of a rush you are in publishing your research. Scope is one of the most interest, interesting and important things to consider, and it's also one of the most common reasons for rejection. So when you're wondering where to send your paper, do make sure that the journal scope matches that of your paper. So, for example, Therapeutic Advances in Neurological Disorders is a clinical journal. Most of our readers are clinical neurologists. So they are mostly interested in papers that have direct implications to patient care. They are often not that interested in studies conducted in cell lines or animal models that investigate early experimental drugs, because it's a long way before we know whether those findings will translate to human care, and clinicians are busy, so they primarily are interested in papers that they know will affect the patient care. On the other way around, uh, a journal that's focusing on preclinical or translational research might not be so interested in very clinical papers. If you're unsure about the scope, do read the journal's manuscript submissions gu guidelines and the aims and scope description. And you can also have a look at the journal's website and see what are the previously published papers and whether they look similar to the one that you plan to submit. Also, do consider the journal's readers and whether they would be interested in your article specifically. So, for example, if you submit your paper to a very good journal that is widely read and cited, if the journal's readers are not interested in your specific article, it might go unnoticed. So, for example, our clinical Readers may not be interested in your article if it's really preclinical, and that would mean that even if it's a good journal, your specific article might not get too many views, and that would mean it would not get cited either. Impact factor is something that we get a lot of queries about. We know that it's very important for many researchers. If it's important for you, please do make sure that you check whether the journal has an impact factor before you submit. So impact factors are granted by Clariot Analytics for established journals. So if you are submitting it, your article into a very new journal, it may not have an impact factor yet. It doesn't necessarily mean that the journal is not good. It's just so new that it doesn't have an impact factor yet. If you're not sure whether the journal has an impact factor, check the website. And if in doubt still, you can contact the editorial office. Impact factors may be mandated by your funders or your institutions. So please check with your funders and institutions whether this is something that they are interested in and if it's something that they mandate. Do it before you submit so as not to find out in the middle of the submission process that this is not a journal that you can publish in. Also, some institutions would prefer you to publish in journals that have a high impact factor. So do check also whether the impact factor of your intended journal is high enough before you submit. Relating to the impact factor, somewhat is the quality threshold of the journal. So especially journals with very high impact factors are often very selective, and their quality threshold may be very high. That means your paper might not be that likely to get accepted. If you're aiming very high, the chance of your paper getting rejected is fairly high as well. So it's always a compromise. So be realistic about where your research may get published. 
at the same time, you usually will want to aim as high as possible, especially if you're not in too much rush of getting your paper published and you can risk a potential re rejection. Open access is becoming increasingly something that the funders and institutions are interested in. So if this is something that your funder or your institution mandates, do check before submitting whether the journal has an open access option. Quite a few journals these days are called open access journals, meaning all the articles will be published online and are free to read for everybody. They usually have something called Article Process in Charge or APC to fund the open access publication. There are also a number of subscription channels that will be able to open your article into an open access paper for an additional fee. So do check. Most journals will have these kind of options, but not all. So if this is important for you or your funders or your institution, again, check ahead, check before submitting. And if not sure, visit the manuscript submission guidelines or contact the editorial office. Length limits vary across the journals. So some journals have fairly stringent limits. These should be spelled out in the journal submission guidelines. So if you need to have fairly detailed results or discussion section, do check that your article will fit in the journal's format. Also, if you need to publish your paper quickly, you may want to understand the journal's turnaround times. They may be telling you the average time from for a submission to first decision, or if they don't declare it, you may be able to look at the papers published recently in the journal and have a, an idea of the average turnaround time. However, I should have to stress that usually these times are indeed average turnaround time, so your article may take longer to publish, or sometimes it may be quicker. And if you are in a rush to get your results out there on the public domain, most journals nowadays are preprint friendly. So you can post your article to a preprint server before you submit it to the journal. So Sage also provides a number of pre-submission services. If you're not sure whether your paper's in the scope of the intended journal, as I said, have a look at the papers previously published, have a look at the aims and scopes. But if you're not sure, you can always send an email to the relevant journal and ask them to let you know whether your paper is in their scope. So you can send either the abstract of your intended article, or you can send a whole article draft for confidential review. This kind of service is free, uh, there is no payment involved, and the editorial office will usually be able to get back to you within a few days. If you're still not sure where to submit, I can highly recommend SagePath. So this is a free service where an expert editor will be reviewing your article, and they will be able to let you know which journals are the best fit for your research. So you will be sending a complete article, not just an abstract, but a complete paper to the SagePath. And the expert editor will let you know where you should submit it. You then get a chance to either reject or take up one of the offers. And you will also be able to specify a number of things, for example, whether you would like to publish in an open access journal, whether you want to publish in a journal that is free to publish in, whether you need a journal with an impact factor, or whether you want to publish in a broad scope medical journal, or whether you would prefer a more niche journal, for example, a neurology journal, or a child neurology journal and so forth. And they will take into account your preferences. We will try their best to recommend the best journal for your article. Language editing is also a service where we get a lot of requests. And we understand that not everybody is a native speaker. I'm not either. So I understand you really well. So we are able to provide a language editing service. And this is a paid service, but it's fairly reasonable price depending on the length of your article. And you can use this service also if you submit to another journal. It doesn't matter where you submit to. It's, it's a separate service that you can use before submitting your article anywhere. And it helps the peer reviewers and the editors to focus on topics other than language, namely the scientific content. So it's very popular. So about preparing your article, please pay attention to what I'm about to tell, because first impressions do count. First of all, publishing ethics. 
the most important thing about publishing ethics that I want to say is do not plagiarize other people's work. And I'm going to say it again. Please, please do not plagiarize other people's work. We see it a lot. And most often, it's not plagiarizing the actual science. It's just copy paste in the text that has been previously published. But it's a problem that will reject, will mean that your article will get rejected, or at least it will get sent back to you for editing. So when you're drafting your article, please make sure that you reference everything you use. When you're writing the first draft of your article, make sure that if you're copy pasting text from somewhere, that you reference it in your draft version and also highlight it so you know what you have copied where. And later when you're completing your manuscript, you can edit these sections for language so that it's not redundant with previously published material. And this will help you a lot, but it's more easy to do it when you write the very first drafts of the article, because later on it's going to be difficult for you to find out where you got each of these little segments of your text. So definitely don't copy paste complete sentences or paragraphs, not even if it's your own text, because the publisher of your previously published article may own the copyright for the text, which means we can't publish it. So if you are having draft versions with this kind of complete sentences or complete paragraphs, do mark them up for yourself, and then you can later go and edit those sections. That will make your life a lot easier than if you have to send the paper back to you for editing at a later stage. And importantly, do not submit the same article to different journals at the same time and wait which of them will give you a decision first. This is known as dual submission, and it's not considered acceptable. Also, if you have an article with multiple authors, please make sure that all the authors have agreed the submission before you send the article to a journal. Make sure that you also have agreed on things such as order of authors before you submit, because changes to this kind of things are a lot more tedious after the article's first version has been submitted. We usually have to ask you to sign a declaration form which needs to be signed by all the authors. So do make sure that you're sorting everything out before you submit your research to a journal. And I think this is something that everybody already knows, but please do not falsify or tidy up your results. This is misconduct, and discovery of this kind of things can end careers. We appreciate that it's very tempting, but please do a service to yourself and do not do it, no matter how tempting it might be. Finally, when your article is under peer review or decisions have been made on it, do not try to influence the editors. Do not also try to influence the peer reviewers if you know or think you know who they are. It's not acceptable. If your article is getting a rejection decision and you think it was not warranted or you think you can address the peer reviewer comments, uh, you may appeal to the editor, but please be polite and please be patient. It's okay to appeal, but please do not try to put pressure on them. It's also not considered okay. That being said, the editors are usually quite reasonable and they will consider appeals. You can find more information on publishing ethics on the publicationethics.org, and I highly recommend that you familiarize yourself with it. Also, many of the journal submission guidelines will have more guidance on publishing ethics and the requirements of each specific journal. Another really valuable research resource is uh, the Equator Guidelines. So this comes from enhancing the quality and transparency of health research. If you're conducting any kind of medical research, I very highly recommend that you have a look at the Equator Guidelines because they are very comprehensive. And all articles submitted to NSH journals should conform to the Equator Guidelines for health research reporting. And there are different kinds of guidelines of different study types. So for example, if you are conducting a randomized trial, it should conform to the consort guidelines and it should, for example, um, be pre-registered. So before you enroll the first patient, you, you should register your trial into a WHO approved clinical trial registry. Um, we also want all the systematic reviews and meta-analysis to follow PRISMA guidelines, for example, and for case reports, we have care guidelines. 
And these are really comprehensive guidelines, so do have a look at those before you submit your research. And I would actually recommend that before you even start your study, you have a look at these guidelines so that you don't find later on that you should have done something that you didn't pay attention to. So this is a really good research um, guideline and resource, and I highly recommend you go and visit www.equatornetwork.org. Regarding overall presentation of your article, I think the most important thing is that you read the manuscript submission guidelines on the journal website carefully. Pay a particular attention to the research ethics section. So if you are conducting human or animal research, your article should have ethics committee or institutional review board approval before you initiate your study. And in your article, Please do not forget to mention the name of the committee that approved the study as well as the approval number. A lot of the time we are sending articles back to the authors because the statement's missing. And almost always they have a, obtained the approval, but they just fail to have the information in the manuscript. So just make sure that you include it so that will save you time when you submit the paper. Also, if you're conducting any kind of interventional study on human patient, you should have a written informed patient consent. Importantly, also, if you're submitting a case series or a case study, you should obtain a written informed patient consent from the patient publication of their medical data and images. This is very important. And also, if you are running a clinical trial, you have to register the study protocol on a WHO approved clinical trial registry before you start the study, before you enroll the first patient. This is important because we are unable to publish any trials that haven't been prospectively registered. On a more general note, please make sure that the figures and tables are clear and legible. Make sure your references, figures, and tables are ordered sequentially and use text is readable and spelled correctly. If you're in doubt, seek advice from native speakers or colleagues or use an editing service. And I'm emphasizing all these points because if you do not follow the AVO guidance, your work may be immediately rejected before progressing to peer review, or at least the editors may be sending your article back for supplementing the data, adding more statements, potentially adding substantial work before your article can progress. So again, you're saving yourself a lot of time by making sure that you adhere to these points before you submit your paper. Structure of a paper. I'd say the most important thing about your paper is the title, because that's the thing that everyone will see, and they will use the title to decide whether or not to read the whole paper. So pay attention to your title that is descriptive of your study and that is catchy. Beyond the title, an article generally would have the following sections, and I will go a little deeper into this in a minute. So abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussion, conclusions, and then there, of course, will be references, figures, and tables. Beyond the title, abstract is the most important part of your article. So it should be a brief summary of your paper, around two to 300 words. And it's the deciding factor on whether your article will be read or cited. So for example, on PubMed, as you know, when a person comes across your article, they will only be seeing the abstract. And they will use the abstract to decide whether they actually will read your paper. So do pay close attention to writing a really good abstract that will go a long way in getting your research uh, discovered. Abstracts should not be a discussion of existing literature. Rather, it should tell what you have achieved. So it should be a brief summary of what was done. And I would highly recommend that you write it last. Or at least, once you have finished writing your paper, do go and revisit your abstract. Because for a lot of time, especially if your paper goes through multiple editing rounds or it gets revised several times, the abstracts of your first version will not correspond to the final content of the article. So do revisit it once you have finished your paper and after each revision round. For health research, uh, there are two types of abstracts, namely structured, which is usually used for original research, and this would have the background, methods, results, and conclusion of your study in separate sections, 
And this unstructured abstract that are mostly used for review articles and case reports. So pay attention to which kind of abstract your journal will require for which kind of study. Introduction is another really important part of your article because it's what the re reviewer or editor or uh, ultimately the reader will see first. The most important thing for the introduction is to place your work in context. It should explain the reader what have you done and why have you done this work. Why is it important and why should the reader be interested? Beyond it should explain what you have done, but most important, just put some context into your study. And the introduction should be understandable for people also who do not work in this immediate field. So it should appeal to a slightly wider audience. These are really important things to get right in any paper. Again, many more people will read your paper if this is done well. As for the methods, explain your starting point. Who are your patients or experimental subjects? What did you evaluate or measure? What assumption have you made, for example, regarding the normality of the data? What kind of protocols did you follow? Any technical details that are important for your readers or other researchers to reproduce your study? Any mathematical formulations or derivations that you used? How did you calculate or measure your results? How did you, for example, correct for multiple comparisons? And it should be detailed enough to be reproducible. If the journal doesn't have enough space in the meta section, you may be able to add some supplementary materials, but it's best to put it in the article text itself. Also, this is a good place to put your ethics statements in unless you are making a separate section of the ethics statements. The most important thing about the ethics statement is that they should all be in one place. So either everything in the methods or everything in a separate ethics statement in the end of the article. Regarding results, uh, keep it brief, explain in numbers what you have found. So this is where you're going to include the p-values, confidence intervals, relative risks, odd ratios, that sort of things. Keep it brief, do not discuss or interpret your results just yet. And this is also where you will be including your figures or tables. Graphical representation of your results can be very helpful, so please take advantage of it when you can. Discussion. Please explain what you just discovered. And how do your discoveries relate to or compare with existing knowledge? So this is the place where you put some context to your findings. Explain to the reader what your results mean. And why, what does the reader need to understand about these results? Again, please try to keep the section understandable also for people who are not experts in this immediate field. This will help your research to get um, understood by more people and it will increase your influence. It will increase your article's influence in the clinical world. Also, an important section is to include the limitations of the study. So every study has limitations and confounding factors, and that's OK. It's just important that you acknowledge these limiting factors. And this is where you can also state what kind of additional research should be done to overcome these limitations. And having a section on limitations is quite important, because if it's not present, usually the peer reviewers will pick up on that, and they will potentially criticize you more harshly than if you acknowledge the limitations of your study in the first place. So be realistic. Do not try to hide the confounding factors. Uh, state them out and explain what can be done to overcome them. Conclusions uh, should summarize your paper and in a very brief statement explain what wider significance your work has. And here you can again outline some future directions for this line of research. And again, please do be realistic. Do not overhype your findings. The people who have read the paper should understand the significance of your article if you did your discussion well. References should be from trusted, peer reviewed resources. So I would things such as Wikipedia, websites of any non-reviewed sources, Please try to primarily use research articles that have been published in peer-reviewed high-reputation journals. 
If no such sources, sources are available for your statements, you can include citations to preprints if there is no peer-reviewed article yet. So in rapidly developing fields such as machine learning, COVID-19, there is not necessarily that many peer-reviewed articles out yet. So if you have to, you can use preprints. Just use the DOI, Digital Object Identifier, in the reference. And importantly, when your article is being revised or it gets accepted and you get to prove, do go and revisit the preprint that you cited to make sure that there is no peer-reviewed version of the article published yet. Because quite often, a few months later, the preprint has been published somewhere, and you can then uh, update the reference to cite the peer-reviewed source. If you use the reference, it, so if you make a statement, please try to always reference it and give the credit to the researchers that make that finding. References generally should allow the reader to read around the subject and understand your paper, even if they are not immediate experts in this field. So reference widely enough for people who want to familiarize themselves in this topic so that they can understand what your paper is about. At the same time, please try to avoid unnecessary references, especially if you are unnecessarily citing yourself this kind of excessive self-citation can be a reason for rejection. So do not cite your own papers if they are not essential for this article. After submission, uh, if you need to communicate with editors, please be patient and polite. So we get quite a few status inquiries. And usually, you can see the status of your manuscript yourself from the journal's manuscript submission system. So it should say something like, submitted, under evaluation, in review, and so forth. So please check the manuscript submission system first. If it's unsure where your article is and it's been two or three months and you have no updates from the journals, yes, you can definitely contact the editorial office. Just please be patient and polite, because the editors are often volunteers who have full-time clinical or research jobs, and they may be very busy. That being said, if you maintain a polite approach, they are generally really happy to help and answer your questions. So if you're really in doubt what has happened to your articles or, if, or you have any questions, you can contact them. And let's say your article got peer reviewed and you are receiving the revision decision, which is the most common decision. You are already among the 25 best articles, 25%. So industry-wide, 75 of all our articles are rejected after the first round of peer review. So if you got the chance to respond to reviewer comments, you are in the 25 best percent. So it's good news. And the peer reviewers are generally usually trying to help you improve your work. So please don't take their comments personally. And make sure when you're making the revisions that you are marking up any changes that you are making. That you can do by highlighting any edits that you are making in the text, or you can use in Word, for example, the track changes function. This way, when your article is sent back to the journal, it's very easy for the editors and the reviewers to see what changes exactly have you made. In addition to marking up your changes, please include a point by point rebuttal. So answer for each and every comment that the peer reviewers have made. And this is, again, important so that they can see what exactly you have done. You don't necessarily have to make edits to your paper as an answer to each of these comments that the peer reviewers made. So you don't have to agree with the reviewers, but please explain in the rebuttal why you disagree and why you think changes are not necessary. Again, the editors will usually mediate, so if they feel that some of the peer reviewers' comments were unwarranted, they will usually understand it. So you don't need to agree with them, but if comments were unwarranted, please explain to the editors why. Finally, I'm going to recap this all by some examples on what the editors are looking for. If you have a really good memory, you might remember this radio mix article by Yu Peng Li and colleagues that I showed that is part of one of our special collections. And why I thought this is a good paper is that it addresses a relevant research question, namely the early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So it's quite important that we are able to diagnose people with mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease early, because later into the disease course, there are fewer things that can be done for these patients. So for example, in 
uh, drug de development, it's usually targeted these early patient populations that have an early phase disease and not so much neurodegeneration yet, because there's less that we can do for these patients at a very late stage when they have structural damage. So the research question is relevant as one of the important things. And on the formatting point of view, as you can see, it has a structured abstract. So there is background methods, results, conclusion, and keywords. And keywords are actually quite a good thing to include. So this will help the readers to find your article in PubMed or Google Scholar and so forth. So think about the potential reader of your article and what kind of keywords would they be using to search for this kind of paper. More about this paper, they have included the ethics committee name and approval number, as well as a statement on patient consent. And this is the kind of stuff that we as editors are always looking for. Furthermore, they have explained the study design very well with all the formulations and so forth, so it's reproducible. And again, there are limitations of the study that are clearly lined out. And the conclusions and limitations on the oil high intense study. They are quite uh, honest what they can and cannot show. Another article example is the systematic review and meta-analysis. Again, the important thing for us is that it addresses a relevant research question. So they wanted to know which patients with multiple sclerosis are at risk of disease reactivation upon natalizumab discontinuation. And again, you can see that there is a structured abstract with background objective methods, results, and conclusions. And it adheres to the preferred reporting items for systematic review and meta-analysis. So this is the PRISMA guidelines that are part of the Equator guidelines that I told you about earlier. So these authors clearly read the Equator guidelines, which is what we want them to do. Finally, I have a review. And here you can see an unstructured abstract. And the title and the answer clearly inform what the article is about. It's clear, clear from one glance what this article is telling. Again, there are some useful keywords, and it's well written. And the tables give a basic mission and a glance overview of the content. And most importantly, it summarizes important developments relevant for clinical care. So someone who is a basic clinician wants an update of what's happened in, for example, in this case, deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease over the past few years. And this is how they can get the information in a condensed form. Example of common mistakes, common reasons for rejection include, in our journal, which is a clinical one, that the study was done in cell lines or animal models using experimental drugs that has not been approved for human use. So we know any clinical application would be several years away at best. And unfortunately, these are usually lower priority and cannot be considered. It's unclear in that kind of studies whether the findings would actually ever translate to human patients. So often they just unfortunately do not make the cut. And we will be referring them to other journals. Uh, sometimes study is not addressing an important research question, so it's considered of only limited interest. And again, we would refer those papers somewhere else that is interested in lower impact papers. Unfortunately, some studies are not well designed. So they might address an important research question, but because of study design, no conclusions can actually be made. Uh, often, the study is underpowered, the sample size is too more, or sample is not representative of real life patients, or there are confounding factors that were not considered. So it's really difficult to say much on the basis of such studies. And again, unfortunately, we have to reject the kind of articles because we can't trust the results and we couldn't trust the conclusions. Another reason for articles to be rejected or sent back to the order for further information to be added is missing trial registration. We cannot consider any trials that didn't get prospectively registered before the first patient was enrolled. Also, if you don't have patient consent, we cannot consider such studies. And we will require ethical committee approval, including the ethical committee name and the approval number for all papers. 
And for reporting, again, if study does not conform, conform to the Equator guidelines, we will either send it back or reject outright. This is just to ensure that the journal um, conforms to the best practices in research reporting. Finally, I will talk you through Sage's portfolio of neurology and related journals. So I've told you quite a bit about therapeutic advances in neurological disorders. So this is part of Sage's flagship clinical journals family, but we have many others. So Journal of Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism is a fairly high impact factor journal. It does publish also quite a few animal studies. So if you're conducting translational research in the stroke, this is a journal you may want to uh, check out. Multiple sclerosis journal is a very well-known journal in its field and very highly esteemed. They also have a sister journal that is open access. Cephalogia is the journal to target if you are conducting research into migraine or cluster headache or tension type of headache, also a very widely read journal. There is a journal of psychopharmacology, which is well known, and this is again one of those journals that also publishes animal model studies, as does molecular pain, as does also ASN Neuro. Finally, I wanted to introduce you to the Journal of International Medical Research. So this is an interesting broad scope journal because they have language and technical editing inbuilt in the article processing chart. So if your article is accepted, the editors of the journal will work closely with you to iron out any issues with the language or technical reporting. To summarize, neurology has a wide range of rapidly developing topics. It's a really interesting area to be working in. Sage has a really varied and prestigious journal portfolio. So we have journals for almost all kinds of research. So do choose your journal and prepare your article carefully to maximize its chances to get accepted. And the journals all have extensive guidelines and other resources. Please use them. If you're still unsure, you're always welcome to contact the editorial office of the journal. And finally, I wanted to introduce you Sage's academic resources. So please do follow us to obtain more information about Sage journals, academic resources, and interactive activities. You can click the About Sage on the WeChat menu to find more. And we have also prepared a Chinese order gateway for you. That's all I want to share with you. So thank you so much for tuning in. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them at the moment. And yeah, I hope to see your research submitted to a journal soon. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, the first question is that how can I choose a suitable journal for my manuscript as a young researcher just to begin my career? Is it appropriate to always choose the journal with higher impact factor? This is a really good question. Um, it depends on whether you think that you have realistic chances of getting accepted in the journal. So I would recommend to have a look at the journal's papers that they have recently published and if they seem similar to your article. And just be realistic. If, for example, your article doesn't seem that it's quality-wise quite on par, you may want to seek a journal with a slightly lower quality threshold. If you are unsure, you can always email the editorial office with your abstract or the draft of your article. And also, I mentioned the Sage uh, Auto Pathway. So you can submit your article there, and they will pretty much give you the best possible journals. So they will do the kind of quality assessment for you. And it's free of charge, even though some of the receiving journals may have APCs. But you can also say you don't have the APC fund, so I want to only publish for free. So that's one option around it. If you always aim to the very highest impact factor journals, the problem may be that you will end up rejected multiple times, and it will take you a long time to get your article published. So that's why I'm suggesting being quite realistic with your expectations. Because as a young researcher, you often need to show what you've done on a fairly quick turnaround when you're being considered for faculty positions or promotion. So that's why the time may be quite important factor for you to decide. But it depends all on your individual situation. OK, uh, thank you. And the second question will be, how do you think about a research manuscript from interdiscipline area? 
for example, should a ministry of applying deep learning methods to neuroscience to submit it to a computer science journal or a neuroscience journal like TAM? This is a really good question, and I'm afraid there is no clear-cut answer. It depends a lot on the individual journal's profile. So, for example, in the therapeutic advances in neurological disorders, we have had quite a few fairly technical papers on neuroimaging. I think you should primarily think about your audience. So, who's the person who is reading this article, and where will they find that article? So, if you Thinking about radiologists primarily, a broader scope imaging journal might be more suitable. So try to think of the end user, the reader of your article, who's likely to read it, and try to find a journal whose audience matches the intended reader of your article. But yeah, as I said, it's kind of a case by case consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, next question. Uh, my paper got different review comments from different uh, two different reviewers. One reviewer commented a major revision, but one reviewer commented accepted. But the journal editor finally rejected my paper. What should I do in this case? Okay. This is something that we see quite a lot. The peer reviewers don't necessarily agree, and the editor will always have the final word. So it may be that one of the reviewers have found some flaws in the study design or pointed out something that the editor thinks precludes its um, publications. If, if you think that this was unwarranted, you may contact the editor and ask why, but it's often that the editor has other reasons for rejection that may not have been pointed by the peer reviewers. So I think probably the best thing you can do is to revise your paper according to both of the peer reviewers comments and send it to another journal. If you feel that your research was unfairly peer reviewed, you might contact the editor and say that you feel that you can address all the peer review comments and revise your paper and ask whether they would be willing to consider a revised paper. If you can make a case that you think you are able to address the peer review comments, they might be open to the appeal. But I would in any case just prepare, be prepared to revise and address the peer reviewers comments and then wherever it gets submitted it will have a higher chance of being accepted. Okay, next question. Uh, there are many Chinese scholars who work uh, in editorial board member uh, of such journal. Uh, how does one scholar or researcher become a, a, a reviewer or a member of the editorial board member? If you are interested in becoming a reviewer in one of our journals, you can make an account. So if you go to the journal submission system, it will allow you to create an account. And it will also prompt you to fill in keywords reflecting your research interests and expertise. So I would highly recommend this, because when we are searching for peer reviewers, we are looking at the journal's uh, own database of all the people that we have registered there. So if you go there and put the relevant keywords in on your expertise and interests, we are much more likely to find you. And I would put fairly detailed uh, information in there, including the kind of methods that you're knowledgeable of, and put something much more uh, detailed than just neurology or multiple sclerosis. For example, if you do neuroimaging, explain the kind of um, methods that you are familiar with, if you are an epidemiologist, explain that. If you work in genetics, put that in there. So, so explain also the kind of methods that you are familiar with. That way we will find you, and we are much more likely to invite you. The other thing is that uh, it helps if you have a website. So if your institution doesn't have a website, we are much less likely to find you. And quite a few uh, reviewers, researchers, uh, aspiring editor or board members do set up an individual website that's not linked to their institution website if they don't find their institution is providing it. Again, when we are seeking people, we are more likely to find you. Uh, same pretty much goes for if you are interested in becoming an editor or board member. We need to find you, so we need to have that information somewhere, be it on the journal's own submission system or somewhere on the World Wide Web. Finally, 
if you are interested in a particular channel, you can always contact us. So we do occasionally receive applications for becoming editorial board members. And if you are able to make a case, uh, we might very well consider you. Or if the journal is not recruiting editorial board members, we may be able to recommend you another journal. So please be proactive and contact the editors and ask if it's possible to become involved. We are generally always in the lookout for enthusiastic and knowledgeable individuals. So uh, don't be too shy. Please contact us. Uh, OK, next question. It seems that journals would be more interested in articles in clinical application or transformation. So uh, what's the best way for studies of uh, with basic experiments to publish on say journal like uh, TAN or other sage uh, journal title? Yeah, we have quite a few. So uh, there was a slide previously about some of the journals that consider also preclinical and translational research and we have quite a few, so it depends a bit on the area where, you, where you're conducting research. And well, if you go to the SAGE journals website, the general website, you can also search journals by discipline, and you will be able to find many more journals there. I only showed you a small fraction. So I appreciate it may be overwhelming to know of all of these journals, which is the best destination. So again, I. If you get overwhelmed, just consider the Sage Path service where they will do the searching for you or contact us with your manuscript abstract or the full paper and we will try our best to recommend you the best journal. But yeah, have a look at the journal website, the aims and scopes, and also the previously published papers. Uh, okay, next question. Mm. Uh, assuming that all formatting guidelines and requirements are met, what would uh, distinguish one paper from another when being considered for publication? Would it be uh, the quality of the di discussion session or the uh, impact of the study results? Both. I would say all of those things matter. I think whether the research question is relevant, it will make a big difference. So if there's a paper that addresses a burning question and the study is well designed. I think things such as what's the quality of the discussion section can be addressed by the author. So a lot of the time, if the research is really high quality and it addresses a really burning question in the field, we are much more likely to consider it. So perhaps the peer reviewers or editors will point out that you need some work, in which case we can always send it back to you for some editing and improving the discussion. So I would say that First and foremost, consider the study design, whether your um, study is addressing an important question in the field. Because many other things can be addressed, but if your study design wasn't great, or if your research question is not very relevant, there is less that you can do. But all of those things matter. Uh, OK, thanks. Next question. If my uh, submission has already been rejected by my aimed journal, should I need to uh, make change according to the reviewer's comments and submit uh, once again, or should I consider uh, other journals? I would suggest that you revise your manuscript according to the peer reviewer's comments anyway, even if you're submitting it somewhere else, because most likely, the peer reviewers are trying to generally help you and improve your article. So if you revise your article and send it somewhere else, it will have a higher likelihood of being accepted by that journal. The other reason is that it's possible that the same reviewer will be seeing this article, even if it's been, if it's been sent to another journal, and it will not be received very well if you did not address their comments, because they will only be asking the same things again. So I would suggest you revise anyway. Okay, uh, I think we still have uh, one minute for one more question. So this will be our last question today. Uh, so the question is, if we choose the journal that recently published a sim similar paper, would it be disadvantages for the author because the journal has already published a similar one? Usually, the editor pray for uh, diversity, or is it okay to submit? I would say generally it's okay to submit. We do like some diversity, but Many of the journals publish uh, quite broadly across other topics as well. So I would not definitely be put off by it. 
and even in the worst case, the editors will be able to tell you quite quickly uh, that they consider too similar. But yeah, there are so many interesting research questions in the same niche fields that I would not let it prevent me from submitting. So yeah, definitely do try if it's a journal you want to publish in. Uh, okay, I think our time's up, so that's all for today. Uh, thank, thank you all you so for much. joining. Thank you, Hemi. Thank you all for joining our, us today.